Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Canadian Memorial United Church this uh, lovely Sunday morning. We're so grateful that you've joined us online, and we have five uh, of our congregants here in person. We're so grateful to see your lovely faces. It's been a while for some of you in person, so we're so glad you're here, along with the uh, um, people that are participating in worship today. just want to take a moment to say thank you to Ben Goheen, who is our guest cellist today, and Bruce McKenzie, who is our wonderful organist. It's great to have um, you both here, and that was gorgeous. Thank you. So we're, as you can see, switching things up a little bit with our instrumentation. The, uh, the boys in the band are taking a well-deserved break this weekend. Um, they've been, Jay Esplana particularly, has been filling in for me, uh, leading the music, and I'm very grateful. He's done a great job. I went online and looked last week as I was doing dishes in our RV, <laughs> and, um, and it, was, it was great to be with you virtually that way. And... Um, you know, to know everything was in such great hands. Uh, Hannes and I were away. Uh, I was the musician in residence at Naramata Center for a couple of weeks, um, which was fantastic. It's a beautiful place. I hope we can all go there as a congregation one day, like the old days. Ann Sainis, who is here today, tells me about um, the times that the church would go up there um, en masse for Thanksgiving, I think it was, right, Ann? And uh, anyway, so we uh, loved our time there, and then we had a bit of a working vacation in Asuyas, and we're, we were in the lake a lot. So we're grateful to be back with you. Um, and I should have started with this, but we uh, worship on the, gratefully acknowledge that we worship on the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil Nation lands, and we're grateful for that, and we are very happy to be here in this beautiful building um, this Memorial for Peace building, and uh, today, uh, that's kind of some of the theme, in fact, but um, I'll, we'll let you sort of feel that as we go. Uh, we are starting with um, people in the church. You're welcome to stand if you like at any point. You don't have to. I'm not going to direct anything as far as that's concerned. People at home, we expect you to stand for every song, though. <laughs> All right, here we go.
wonderful to have Lonnie back and Hannes at the camera and Emma, church dog, uh, and Beth is due back after a well-deserved and I think much, much appreciated month-long holiday uh, later in the week. You know, there's a story I like to tell my kids about how I got the job being their Sunday school teacher. And I tell them that at the time I was looking for a job, I didn't want anything that involved my heart. My heart was tired. And through the interview, I wanted to make it clear that things were clean cut. And so it seemed as the conversation went along, like I could come in on a Sunday morning and then maybe one or two other days during the week, and then that would be it. I could go home. But I tell the kids, the interviewers tricked me <laughs> because they didn't mention Ben and they didn't tell me about Micah and Jaden. And was it by accident that they said nothing of Madeline or Emma or Fiona? And the names, of course, go on. And it wasn't long after I started work here that my heart was reeled right in. And that's the way with love. It, uh, it pushes past the defenses of our heart. It has this gravitational pull to it. And I know there's so much love between people in this community, and I know how much you're missing each other. So I want to light our Christ candle today as a way of holding space for that love. A love that has its beginning and its end, as all love does in God.
was lost in the music. <laughs> That's what I want to believe. <laughs> no, it's just that Jay did three songs before the announcements, oh, and you just okay. did two. So Surprise. I was off cue. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, the pandemic has affected all of us differently, and uh, that includes our finances. Not everyone is in a position where they can give at this point, but many of you have and are supporting this live stream service and the ongoing work and voice of the church in these troubled times. So we wanna say thank you, whether it's a one-time gift or sustained ongoing support, thank you for that. There is, I believe, a donate now button. 
under your screen or you can find it in the chat. And if all else fails, you, you can go um, to the church website. Or if you're not at all electronically inclined, I'm sure um, there's a way to drop gifts off directly in person at the, um, at the church office. Today is the last in our series that has run through the month of July, where we've invited leaders really from around the world to answer three questions. Uh, what do you believe for sure? What have you had to let go of? And what do you still wonder about? And today it's, um, it's a delight to welcome Sunia Gibbs to speak to us from Portland, Oregon. She is, in her words, a creator of art and music, spends time with her family and friends, and is a documentary junkie. She founded the Groves Church in Portland with her husband, Paul, several years ago. And on a personal note, I first encountered Sunia a few months ago when one of our personal friends was um, physically and verbally assaulted with anti-racial uh, Asian anti-Asian racial slurs on the streets of Vancouver here. And I believe it was Sunia who reached out to her and gave her a platform and encouraged um, Trixie to use her voice to tell the story, the very underrepresented story of Asian women in, in North America. So I can attest firsthand to Sunia's leadership and look forward to what she has to share with us today. So we're going <clears> to... <throat> Excuse me. We're going to teach you a song uh, that you might know. Um, it's called Salam Aleikum, which um, is Arabic for peace unto you. And uh, so this is a blessing that we sing to each other. And uh, there are actions. Those of you that are in the church today have to do them. And this is how they go. Um, so you'll follow us all. I won't have the opportunity to do the whole time, but I will some of the time. So it's may peace be unto you good. May peace be in your heart. May peace be in your home. May peace be in our world. So that is our prayer this morning. And then when we sing Salam Aleikum Le, which is peace unto you, we just repeat that over and over again um, with the same actions. So uh, we are going to ask you to join us in this and... Uh
I loved seeing you do that while you were doing the pro <laughs> presenter. That was awesome. She would do it and then click it and then back to the actions. That blessed me. So thank you, uh, Sister Hillary, for that. Over now to Heather Reed, who will be reading the scripture this morning. Today I'll read Psalm 103 from the Message Translation of the Bible. It requires little introduction as its powerful poetry speaks for itself. Let these words wash over you and perhaps listen for a line that captures your imagination. Psalm 103. O oh, my soul, bless God. From head to toe, I'll bless God's holy name. O oh, my soul, bless God. Don't forget a single blessing. He forgives your sins, every one. He heals your diseases, every one. He redeems you from hell, saves your life. He crowns you with love and mercy, a paradise crown. He wraps you in goodness, beauty eternal. He renews your youth. You're always young in his presence. God makes everything come out right. He puts victims back on their feet. He showed Moses how he went about his work, opened up his plans to all Israel. God is sheer mercy and grace. Not easily angered, he's rich in love. He doesn't endlessly nag and scold, nor hold grudges forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. As high as heaven is over the earth, so strong is his love to those who fear him. And as far as sunrise is from sunset, he has separated us from our sins. As parents feel for their children, God feels for those who fear him. He knows us inside and out, keeps us in mind that we're made of mud. People don't live very long. Like wildflowers, they spring up and blossom, but a storm snuffs them out just as quickly, leaving nothing to show they were here. God's love, though, is ever and always eternally present to all who fear him making everything right for them and their children as they follow his covenant ways and remember to do whatever he said. God has set his throne in heaven. He rules over us all. He's the king. So bless God, you angels, ready and able to fly at his bidding, quick to hear and do what he says. Bless God, all you armies of angels, alert to respond to whatever he wills. Bless God, all creatures, wherever you are, everything and everyone made by God. And you, O oh my soul, bless God. This is the witness of God's people. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sonia Gibbs, and I am an artist and an activist and a pastor here in Portland, Oregon. I have lived in Oregon and Portland for 13 years, January, no, July, 13 years, just this uh, beginning of July. Uh, my partner, Paul, and I have been married for 23 years. Um, we have three children, 17, 14, and Five. They keep us pretty busy. Um, uh, we moved here to um, start and uh, create um, the Groves Church, which um, will celebrate 11 years this coming fall. Um, last July, we entered into a partnership with United Methodist Church uh, to revitalize and reanimate one of their spaces in the Sunnyside Belmont neighborhood, which is where I am doing this video. I am in uh, their um, historic building. Um, this place was 40,000 square feet. Um, it was finished in 1910. I am in one tiny little corner of the space um, right here in the heart of hipster land, Portland, um, on Belmont and Yamhill, in case you're, you are familiar with the city. Um, but we're about, uh, I would say, three, three kilometers um, east of downtown Portland. 
So um, it's in a, uh, the neighborhood is, has always been and uh, sort of an upwardly mobile working class uh, white neighborhood. And that's where this facility um, exists and where I'm filming today. Um, I wanted to, to tell you how much I love Vancouver. And I'm not just saying that. So the very first trip I ever um, took to Vancouver was actually just this past January. Um, and there are a few things that are stuck in my, my brain about the experience. The first is that um, in my particular neighbor, neighborhood here, Sunnyside, there um, only about 5% of the population is Asian American, which means that I can walk around here for days um, and um, go to the restaurants and, and, and walk the streets and I can, I can go for days and not see any face that looks like mine, which was not the case when I was in Vancouver, so that felt great um, to me. Um, I also had amazing food and I do, uh, I also went to Revolver Coffee literally every morning that I was there. Um, a cup of coffee and, and maybe the best croissant I've had in my life. Um, so, uh, I, and I'm not just saying this either, Vancouver is the first city on my list that I will visit once the global pandemic has calmed down, the border opens, and it's, it's the first trip on my list. Um, because uh, I had such a fantastic time and I know there's so much more of the city to explore. So all that to say, thank you for inviting me um, to share this morning. And there are three questions that I've been invited to, to speak to and around. And those questions are, what do I know for certain? What have I had to let go of? And what do I still wonder about? Um, so first, let me say, I have been procrastinating like no other on this talk. Um, part of it is because of my personality, for sure. Um, but part of it also is, what do I know for certain? Um, that is such a big question. And and I, it's a bit challenging in this moment because the air that I'm breathing, the context that I am in, is actually filled with so much uncertainty. Um, I don't know um, how much of um, uh, U.S. Um, news you may get in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, but Portland has been um, in our national news quite a bit recently um, because we are entering our 51st day of protesting that has gone on in um, very particular parts of our city. Um, and um, and because of those protests that have been going on and because of the way that they've been framed, uh, the federal government has um, stepped in uninvited, um, but they are intervening and, and that has created a lot of uncertainty and unrest in my particular context. Um, add to that that we have been sheltering in place since March because of COVID-19. My particular county is still in phase one. It's actually sub phase one because we have even more precautions that we are um, and rules that we are now held to because we're seeing an increase um, in cases. So there's uncertainty around what school is going to look like in the fall. Um, am I going to be homeschooling my three children again? That certainly creates uncertainty for me. Um, uh, I'm seeing some of my favorite small businesses struggling, um, maybe even not surviving in this time, so there's uncertainty there. Um, even closer to home, I mentioned we entered this partnership with United Methodist Church, and part of what we're doing is animating um, this, this large space. Um, and just as we are starting to get groups and gatherings and crowds, um, we are now unable to have crowds and to gather together. So that creates uncertainty, um, even in the space that I come on a regular basis uh, to, do, to do my work. So I can, I can smell the uncertainty, I can taste it, I hear it, I feel it. Um, it, is, it is in the air. So it's such a great question to ask in this moment, in this context, what do I know for certain? I am convinced of God's love for me, God's love for the world, and particularly for the marginalized and vulnerable people among us. Um, that may seem like a very cliche or a Sunday school answer, something, of course, as a pastor, I believe in God's love for us, um, but this, Truth is deeply rooted in my own story. I was adopted from South Korea when I was five months old. Um, the very few paragraphs that I have, I can, as I close my eyes, I can picture the piece of paper that has old typewriter um, uh, type, typed out three, three short paragraphs about my life 
in South Korea those first five months and the story is that I was abandoned, left on a sidewalk in February in Seoul, South Korea. A passerby found me and somehow I ended up in um, Holt International um, Adoption Agency. Um, instead of being placed in an orphanage, um, I was placed in a foster home with a couple that were as in their 50s. Um, and I remember this, and um, this is something that has stuck with me for so long. Um, in those few short paragraphs, the words that I remember hanging on to was that their comment about me was that I had sparkling eyes. Um, but before I had done a thing, before I could earn a thing, before I could demonstrate my worth or value or contribute meaningfully to society, even while I was rejected, while I had been abandoned, God heard my cry. A compassionate human who passed by that spot that I was left, heard my cry and took action. A young couple in Minnesota who wanted children saw my picture and they said, yes. We see time and time again in scripture where God hears the cries of the oppressed. He hears the cries of the vulnerable. God rescues the Hebrews from generations of slavery. God instructs and he gives laws to Israel for those who are called by God's name on how to care for the orphan, the foreigner, and the widow, the trifecta of the vulnerable people in our society then and today. And while my personal story begins with the explicit grace and goodness of God, I can frame this story. It starts off abandonment, but it ends, it ends with the grace and the goodness of God. We acknowledge that not every abandoned child, not every human is brought into a flourishing space, which leads me to what have I had to let go of? Two years ago on July 29th, 2018, my friend, my neighbor, a parishioner, a black man was shot and killed by Portland State University police. That university is in downtown Portland, so, so the um, downtown Portland, he, he and we live in the neighborhood right next um, to that, that downtown location. Jason Washington was 44 years old. He died after being shot nine times in his back and his neck and his cheek as he was trying to break up a fight. He left a wife of almost 25 years, three daughters, one granddaughter. When I went to the funeral home to meet with the family, I did not know the measure of sorrow that I would meet in those large echoing halls. Bodies fainting because the pain was so overwhelming. I had not experienced that, where the grief and the sorrow and the pain was so much, so overwhelming that the human body could not contain it. The wailing from Jason's daughters as they entered the room and saw their dad laying there, that wailing reverberates in my body to this day. We'll never ever leave this space. And that Sunday, as our congregation gathered, as I stood before Jason's family and friends, I had to let go of any last remnants of a neat and an easy faith. I had to let go of my own privilege that had kept me from engaging in conversations that I didn't want to have before about race and policing and systems of oppression and I had to let go of my fears of making mistakes, of saying the wrong thing. I had to let go of control. I had to let go of pretense and assumptions and my pride. And there are so many days I've wanted to go back, go back to the easier way, the easier thing, the simpler thing, the, the ways of explaining that didn't have nuance and tension and pain. But we all had to let go. We had to let go of Jason. We had to let go of easy and pat Sunday school answers. We had to let go of our ignorance. We had to let go of our complacency. We wrote songs, we sang laments, we prayed, and we continue to walk together. We protest, we march, we hold vigils, we remember and we celebrate, we cry and we rejoice. And we find ourselves a part of a long history of people crying out to God for justice, 
crying out to God for righteousness, for all to be made right again, to be made good with God, with one another, and with all of creation. There's a lot that I wonder about in my own neighborhood, in my own church facility that was founded and erected during a time in Oregon's history where black and Asian people were by law excluded and forbidden from working or owning homes for 70 years, Oregon state law. What does the good news sound like? What does repentance and reconciliation, reparations, look like? What is it like to pastor a small faith community rocked by a situation that suddenly propels them into a national story and a collective history? How do we respond? How do we behave? How do we pray? What songs do we sing? What words are there to speak? How do we act and what is there to say in our particular context and in our place? What does God have to say? What does God want to say? What is he doing? How is he at work? I'm so very hopeful. Lisa Sharon Harper in her book, The Very Good Gospel, talks about Genesis 1, the creation story. Um, that moment on, on the sixth day when God looks at all he has made and he says, it is very good. She says it means forcefully good. She points out that the Greek perspective was that goodness resided in something. But we have a Hebrew faith. And the Hebrews understood goodness not to be in something, but goodness resides between things. That the goodness God saw was the perfect wholeness and rightness and relationship between all that God had made. And with that in mind, I'm curious and I wonder what it would look like if as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as the church, we weren't trying to assess whether something or someone was good or bad. But if we became a people who worked for right relationships between all things, right relationship in our bodies, in our families, in our friendships, in our churches, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our countries, with all creation, with God. The deeper that I sink into my own context, the more complicated, the more hopeless my experiences might become. Actually, the more hope I have in the unfailing love of God, more hope and trust and, 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 Oh, I hope it's true, the liberating good news of Jesus. And the more that I trust in the Spirit of God with gifts, courage, and comfort for all of us, all that we need as the body. There is a psalm that I often go to. Um, it is a lament. Here's the thing about the lament. The lament is acknowledging the experience, the pain, the sorrow, whatever it is that we are feeling or experiencing as humans in this way of existence and in these systems that we live in. But it's not just the deconstruction. It's not just the sadness. It is the turn to who God is and our response to who God is. And so Psalm 13, I wanna read this Psalm and then close with a song today. The psalmist says this, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O oh God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I've overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. One of the ways that I process and, and um, the output for me is abstract painting and songwriting. 
And when Jason was killed, um, our congregation needed a song to sing to express the lament, to express the place that we were in in that moment. I wanted to sing something like, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And it wasn't that I didn't believe it, it was just that in that moment we needed to sing a different kind of song. And so I wrote this song called, Can You Hear Us? And it is both a sadness and a lament, but it is a hope and um, in a turn to who God is and a, recogn a recognition of how we, we experience and we, um, we will find joy and hope and all that we need collectively together as a body. So I leave you with a song, Can You Hear Us? Thanks for letting me share today. We feel alone, we are afraid. Have we gone too far, too far to be saved? Is this your love that's chasing us down? We've heard what is lost, one day will be found. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us when we sigh? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us when we
Thank you, Sunia. Such heartfelt and honest questions when there are no easy answers. God, we have heard of you, we have heard of your love. Have you heard of us? Can you hear us when we cry? Prayer doesn't get much more basic than that. So let's continue in that spirit as we pray together now. Let's pray. Divine Presence, Holy One, it seems all we can do as we come before you in prayer these days is state the obvious, namely that the ocean of change around us threatens to overwhelm, that the waters are heaving beneath us, that our moorings have come loose, we confess our inclination to get the ship turned back in the direction of our certitudes and security, back in the direction that we have benefited from for generations, only to discover that the continents themselves have shifted, that our points of destination no longer exist, that our maps are obsolete. But we have the ship, we have each other, we have the stars to guide us. Love where it is found is still love, hope, still hope, faith, still faith. Thank you as Sunia has reminded us that goodness is less that which lies within us and more about that which resides between things how we live with each other, how we care for one another, how we care for the earth. So we pray for the places of need within reach, the suffering around us, that we can put a name and a face to today, if not tomorrow. For Linda Denham's brother-in-law in Scotland, Ken, who has been diagnosed with brain cancer, for Elmira in California, who has given everything to speak for those who have no voice, and to denounce the atrocities of intensive animal agriculture. For Rob's Big Star Sandwich Shop in Surrey, sustained during this economic downturn by the support of local customers. For Yuri, who was fighting for her life in the ICU after a bike accident in Whitehorse, and for Kat keeping vigil by her side. For Fatema, single mom at the family shelter down the street, whose son is gripped night by night by anxiety. We trust your goodness, God, even if we can't always see it. Thank you that you have trusted us with this time of undoing. May we hold it well, letting go as our speakers have reminded us of what needs to be let go of, taking up what needs to be taken up, learning to be neighbors all over again, learning to care for each other once more. Thank you for Jesus, who calls us to live simply, so that in times like this, we don't have much to defend or protect. Thank you for the prayer he offered as a way of keeping our hearts grounded in the, basic, in the basics. It's an adaptation of that prayer, the Lord's Prayer that we pray now, in Jesus' name and as he taught us. Most compassionate life giver, may we honor and praise you. 
May we work with you to establish your new order of justice, peace, and love. Give us what we need for growth and help us through forgiving others to accept forgiveness. Strengthen us in the time of testing that we may resist all evil. For all the tenderness, strength, and love are yours now and forever. Amen. joy, peace. These are the magnetic fields of the heart. Learn to navigate by them all over again, if necessary. And if the whole world shifts, they will not. They are gifts from God, and they will not fail you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.